All right. What did zero say to eight? What did zero, what's that? No. What did zero say to eight? You're half me, you're close, you're close, very close. Nice bell. <laughs> That was good, though. You're almost there. All right. Um, what type of clothing do clouds wear? What type of clothing do clouds wear? Cotton. What? Cotton? Okay. Clouds aren't really cotton. But I had, I had to explain that to my kids, too. Like, it looked like cotton. Was that raincoat? No? Thunderwear. I know which, I know which one wrote down. One of them's in this underwear face. Underwear, underwear, everything. All right, thunderwear. I'm gonna have to be more interesting than normal, huh? Because I'm eating with no internet. That is a tall order right there, my friends. Okay. All right, we're in chapter 12. And the way that I like to organize this is I like to talk about nerve physiology first, and then we get into muscle contraction. So we're kind of tracking with lab, we're a little bit behind them, meaning that in, in lab you cover cranial nerves, you've covered histology on the nerves, okay, now you're in the muscle. Well, the reason I want to cover nerve physiology first before we get to muscle is in order to get muscle contraction, you actually have to have a nerve stimulation. Okay, you have to have something happening telling the muscle to do it. Now, in cardiac muscle, that signal is autorhythmic, but there's still an electrical network. There are still nerves, but those nerves come from an area that's autorhythmic. Okay? <coughs> And in smooth muscle, smooth muscle is under involuntary control. That doesn't mean that it's not innervated. It means you don't consciously have to think about it. So we're going to start getting into the nervous system of stuff that you're aware of and stuff that you're not aware of. Okay? So you can see these architectures here and here. We're going to start talking about nerve microarchitecture. We're going to classify nerves. What are nerves? They're, they're basic level. What are they? They're individual neurons that send and receive electric, electrical and chemical signals, and they transport the signals to the brain in order to get reactions. I, I agree. I totally agree with that. That's what they do. But what are they by classification? Yeah. Electrical pathways. Electrical pathways. I agree. <clears throat> what else are they? Cells. What's that? Cells. They're cells. They're just a cell, guys. Do they do? Those two students are totally correct. But here's the problem. The students look at nerves and they're like, oh, this is so complicated. Like, oh, I don't get it. Like, which way's up? Okay. Is that the head or is that, you know, a lot of feet or multiple head? I don't get it. I'm, I'm confused. These are just cells. So if you think back to basic biology, cell biology, we're going to have a nucleus. Okay, we're going to have intracellular organelles. We're going to have a cytoplasm inside. We're going to have a membrane on the outside. Okay? True, they are cells that actually are specialized. So they're specialized cells that can trigger, stimulate, or propagate an electrical signal. But all cells of the body can actually do that. These guys have specialized functions in order to regulate whether or not it happens. Okay? If you don't believe me, we can get some wire, bare wire, because electricity still works, and I can prove to you that other cells conduct electricity. Okay? You've probably seen that yourself. You've probably accidentally been electrocuted a little bit. Okay? And it's not just your neurons that are responding. All right. So what do they do? Well, they do a couple of different things. They perceive stimuli. This is the way that we connect with our outside environment. We have sensory receptors. 
And those sensory receptors are neuronal pathways that are receiving input. Then that input goes to a location in the body that integrates the signal. It takes the signal and it sends it maybe in a couple of different uh, spots, a couple of different locations. Okay? For example, that input might come in and say, oh, it's bright. Okay? Other input might come in and say, uh, it's also hot. Other input might uh, come into play and say, it's, it's humid. Okay, so we integrate all these signals via neurons. Then we actually do something with it. We have an output side to the nervous system. We're going to not just receive information. You know, for example, if a fire alarm went off, we would hear the fire alarm. We would integrate it and process it saying, I think that means we're supposed to exit. And then we would get up and we would do something about it. And the nervous system just interfaced with sensory integration and output. Sometimes the output isn't necessarily muscles like walking. Sometimes the output may be <coughs> glands or organs that are going to secrete something. Think about a meal that you just had, right? It's sort of middle of the afternoon. You just had lunch, and now there's input to the GI tract saying that you have certain compounds that you need to chemically break down, which is digestion. So you're going to start releasing from glands certain enzymes in order to take care of the carbohydrates or the fats or the proteins that you've actually consumed. So you can kind of see in this figure one, two, and three, we have sensory input, then it's integrated, and then we do something about it as motor output. Our sensory input is also referred to as afferent. A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. Afferent neurons. And our motor is referred to as efferent. E-F-F. E R E N T. So we organize the nervous system really into two main categories. And you've covered this in lab, so this is a little bit of review. Don't worry, at the end of the lecture we'll get into brand new stuff. We have the central nervous system, which is made up of the brain and the spinal cord. And that's it. And then the peripheral nervous system is everything outside of that. Everything that's in the periphery, not in the center. So the brain and the spinal cord serves as this main integrating center. It, the brain itself helps to decide information about, oh, I recognize that person. Or that person looks like somebody that I recognize. Okay? I've heard that word before. I recognize that name. I've smelled that smell. That's pizza. Right? There isn't a person in here, whether you like it or not, uh, that wouldn't recognize the smell of pizza, right? So the brain integrates that information. Now the spinal cord also does that, we'll talk about that a little later in the semester, but the integrations that happen at the level of spinal cord are a lot of reflexes. And then the periphery, nerves that leave the central nervous system to interact with the peripheral tissues and organs are part of your peripheral nervous system. So we call the central nervous system the CNS, and the peripheral nervous system, the PNS. And if you look under the list that links the, the, the body to the central nervous system, that's what the peripheral nervous system does. But if you look at what's under here, the spinal nerves that come off the spine and leave are part of the peripheral nervous system, as well as the cranial nerves. Now, we tend to cover cranial nerves in laboratory when we cover the brain because you can see them. But if you think about the sheet brain dissection that you did, those nerves that are cranial nerves are coming out, right? The olfactory nerve and the optic nerve you can actually physically see. Those are the ones that are most obvious. Trigeminal and everything else, usually it's pictures that you're looking at. Because depending upon how the, the brain was excised, it may or may not have cranial nerves, you know, the other cranial nerves, 3 through 12, uh, visible. But you can appreciate that they're not within the brain. They're on the outside of the brain. They're connected, but they come out. So our spinal nerves and our cranial nerves are considered part of the periphery. If we take this peripheral nervous system and we create these little divisions, these buckets, it looks something like this. And we'll see this motif a number of times as we walk through these lectures because we're going to cover the nervous system 
Uh, and then we'll get into peripheral, and we'll get into central nervous system in more detail. So we have our central nervous system, brain, and spinal cord, and it pretty much stops. We have our peripheral nervous system divided into motor and sensory. And they do exactly that. The sensory receives input via sensory afferent fibers. The inflow comes from sensory receptors, and it goes to the central nervous system. <coughs> That's the first couple blanks there. And then we can have what we call somatic afferent fibers or visceral afferent fibers as part of the sensory division. Now, if we talk about somatic, these are going to come from locations like skin, skeletal muscle, and joints. Somatic is referring to parts of the body. That's what that word means. Visceral, this is referring to areas of the viscera that's more like soft internal organs of the body. So, for example... Much of that within the abdominal and the thoracic cavity. Like telling the liver to secrete bile? Correct. That would be visceral, after, as a result of fat intake in your meal. Uh, the first blank, you said sensory afferent what? The first blank, info, they come from sensory receptors and they send it to the central nervous system or the CNS. Now, if we look over here on the motor side, we also have visceral and somatic. And the motor is referred to as efferent, so the output. It goes from the central nervous system to the effector organ, so it goes out. So from the central nervous system to the effector organ. And then this is further divided into main part, two main parts of the visceral motor system. We have what we call our sympathetic branch and our parasympathetic branch. Now, what does each branch do? Who can answer what the sympathetic peripheral nervous system is responsible for? Like a fight or flight? Fight or flight. So we hear that. What does that mean? It's true. But what does that mean if you're not familiar with those buzzwords? Raising heart rate. Increasing respirations. Increasing metabolic rate. Okay? Getting you ready to run or stay and fight. Okay? Sympathetic. <clears throat> fight or flight. Parasympathetic. What does that dominate? What does that control? Rest and, rest and digest. Okay? This is slowing things down. So rest and digest. Why digest? Because when you consume a meal, you actually want to slowly bring the chyme. The chyme is the, is the word we use for digestive a food that's been broken down. And that chyme is full of nutrition. And you want to slowly move it through the GI tract so that you can absorb nutrition out of it. Okay? So this is our general overview of where we're going to spend some time over the next few lectures. Now, if we look at um, somatic nervous system, um, this is under voluntary control. Voluntary control. And the CNS goes out to skeletal muscles so that you can run, or that you can uh, write, or that you can brush your teeth. Okay, that you can do the motor activities to get through your day. Then the autonomic nervous system is also another name for visceral. So the visceral, another substitution word would be autonomic. That's like automatic. You don't necessarily think about, am I going to release bile okay, from the gallbladder? Is it time to manufacture bile by the liver? Okay. Uh, do I need to have pancreatic enzymes being released? You're not sitting here thinking about that. It's under autonomic control. Okay. And that autonomic or that visceral control is where we get our sympathetic and our parasympathetic divisions that we just talked about. So the autonomic tends to regulate and dominate things that are under smooth muscle function. Smooth muscle function. That's where you usually see um, the autonomic or the visceral. Now cardiac will be influenced as well. Skeletal is usually somatic. And 
most of the body is actually smooth muscle. You have, obviously, the heart, but it's in comparison to the amount of smooth muscle you have, uh, cardiac muscle is in far limited supply. Breathing be a little bit of both because, like, sometimes you can control your breathing. That's correct. Yeah. So when, when we start digesting through all of the material, you'll see that there's the ability to override certain things that are under autonomic control, like breathing that was just asked about. So breathing, when you're sleeping, you don't have to think about it. It happens on its own. And inhalation is an active uh, muscle contraction. So the diaphragm is our main respiratory muscle. And when it contracts, it flattens. And that increases the thoracic cavity space, creating low pressure, and then air rushes in from high pressure atmospheric to inside. And then when the diaphragm relaxes, it moves up in a dome shape, it decreases the size of the thoracic cavity, and that forces air out, and that's exhalation. So under resting conditions, exhalation is passive. But you can actually all, we could all say this right now, ready? Take a deep breath, and exhale, forcefully. Right? So you can override some of the autonomic functions. Not always, but in many cases you can. So let's take a peek at some of the physiology at the level of the cells. So if we look at nerve cells and glial cells, these are the two main types of cells that we see within nervous tissue. Neurons, first up, they're excitable cells. What does that mean to you? Excitable cells. They respond to a stimulus. Okay? So they're excitable cells. The neuroglia typically aren't going to be excitable cells. They're supporting type of cells. They form a support role. Neuroglia are what we call glial cells. So you can see on this picture, here is a neuron right here. And we have a couple of different peripheral cells that are in association with that neuron. And those are glial cells. They're 9 to 10 times more, uh, more prevalent than neurons. So out of every 10 cells you count, maybe one of them is a neuron, and the other 9 are going to be glial cells in any given nervous tissue. We have four different types in the central nervous system, and we have two types that we find in the periphery. If we look at the central nervous system, we've got these four to characterize. Astrocytes. They're the most abundant. You can see a picture of an astrocyte right here. They're conveniently colored blue, green for you. Every, I'm just kidding. They're just colored that way in the slide. Okay. But what they do is you're going to see them physically connected to the neuron and then physically attached to the capillary. They help to su structurally support the neuron, hold it in place, suspend it, brace, allow it mechanically to be stabilized. In addition to that, because they're connecting the neuron to the blood vessel, they actually facilitate the exchange of nutrition between the blood vessel and the neuron and the removal of waste products. So they're kind of this intermediary that serves this support role mechanically as well as physiologically. These um, astrocytes early in development also help to guide the developing neuron so it knows where to go. Okay? <clears throat> the microglia. The microglia are these little guys right here. And they serve a macrophage-like activity. Who knows what macrophages do? Kind of, uh, eat up any foreign matter. Okay, so they chew up debris, eat up foreign matter. They phagocytose is the word that we use. They, macrophages have a phagocytic activity where they kind of clean up damaged tissue or debris. Microglia are neuronal-like macrophages. They're, they're small, and they don't have quite the capacity that macrophages do, so they're called micro glial cells. Okay, but in a, in, a, in a stroke patient in nervous tissue in the brain, you would expect to see microglial cells in that scar tissue. And those microglial cells are what are actually laying down that fibrotic lesion. Okay, microglial cells. 
So they, they uh, serve a cleanup function. Then we have um, these ependymal cells. They line the central cavities right here. They line the central cavities of the brain and the spinal cord. And they form a barrier between the blood and the brain. And they allow for CSF production, cerebral spinal fluid production. The oligodendrocytes, the last one on our list, the oligodendrocytes right here, you can see how they're in between these two neurons, and they are what form this myelin covering or this wrapping. Do you guys remember, if you read ahead, what does myelin do for us? Okay, so it, it, it insulates the nerve, okay? So it does have a protection type of role. But the physiologic role is what she said secondly as well, which is it helps to speed up the action potential, the electrical signal. And we're going to look at that very carefully. Now, if we compare this to what's going on in the peripheral nervous system, we only have two. It's much easier to remember. The two that we have here are satellite cells. They surround the, the neuron cell body, or the soma, they provide electrical insulation, and um, they also um, regulate the chemical environment around the nerve. So what cell does that sound like? What's its counterpart in the central nervous system? The astrocyte. So the astrocyte and the satellite cells are kind of synonymous in different areas of the, of the nervous system. And then the Schwann cell, they're actually what manufactures the myelin sheath in the periphery. And you can see here's a piece of myelin, piece of myelin, piece of myelin. And so this myelinated sheath, and here this is labeled Schwann cell, you can kind of see this process. The Schwann cell kind of wraps around the neuron and forms this myelinated sheath. So what cell type does the Schwann cell most resemble in the central nervous system? the uh, oligodendrocyte, right? Oligodendrocyte. Very good. Okay, so if we look at myelination, how does it work? Well, first up, what I want you to be able to think about is if you take um, a bare electrical wire, because that's what neurons really are, wires. They're biological wires. Okay, and just like wiring, if you cut the wire, what happens to the ability for electricity to flow? Bye bye. It stops. Bye bye. It's gone. Okay? So, wires biologically are neurons. Now, if you have done any electrical work, even if you haven't, you might know this. If you're going to go wire a stereo system and you have really expensive equipment, you have a nice amplifier, okay, and you have really nice quality speakers. Do you want a really thin diameter wire, or do you want a really fat diameter wire? Fat. fat. You want a big diameter wire to carry more current. The other thing is, do you want inexpensive insulation around the wire to preserve the integrity of the electrical signal, or do you want high quality insulation around your electrical wire? You want high quality. So if you go shopping, for example, for like an HDMI cable, or for any type of cables for sound equipment or audio video equipment, the more expensive wiring is one that uses higher quality wire, usually a larger diameter on the inside, and it's a higher quality insulator to preserve the integrity of the signal. That's exactly what happens biologically here. So, you take an axon, which is our bare wire, and <clears throat> The myelin sheath, it is made up of the phospholipid bilayer that is made up of what? It's fat, lipid, and it has transmembrane proteins that are embedded in it, right? So if you took a phospholipid bilayer and you put a wire or a neuron and then you kind of rolled it, right? And you're rolling it and rolling it and rolling it, you're going to get layers like making a cinnamon roll. You're going to make layers and layers and layers of 
of this phospholipid bilayer that has proteins embedded in it. Does, does that make sense? And as you do that, you can see you start creating a thicker, thicker insulator to preserve the underlying signal that's inside the cell. Okay? The Schwann cell, or the oligodendrocyte in the central nervous system, it kind of makes more phospholipid and kind of keeps scooting back as it's rolling. And so the Schwann cell occupies kind of this outermost layer, which is your um, Schwann cell location. And then underneath it is layer and layer and layer and layer of a phospholipid with protein in it, and that's the myelin sheath. Make sense? So the neurilemma that we see is the outermost part that houses that Schwann cell as it continues to scoop back and lay out more membrane that can be rolled. So the Schwann cell doesn't wrap around and die. The Schwann cell stays intact and says, you just use as much of my membrane as you need. I'm just going to hang out over here on the edge. And that's the neurilemma that houses the Schwann cell. The myelin sheath is underneath that. It's deep to the neurilemma. And it's the part that's actually insulating the neuron. Now, as you roll this out, if you look at this previous picture, you can imagine it takes a lot of biologic energy to do this, right? So you're balancing this. Well, why do we wrap it? Well, we want to protect it, and we want to speed up the signal. But I can cheat a little bit, and I can keep these gaps open. And if I make these gaps open, I save some of this biological energy, and those little gaps are called these nodes of Ranvier. Or as Americans would say it, nodes of Ranvier. Okay? Nodes of Ranvier are the bare axon in between the myelinated sheath, or in between the Schwann cells, where the neuron is actually exposed. The oligodendrocytes do this in the central nervous system, and if you have neurons in the central nervous system that are unmyelinated, that's considered gray matter. If they're myelinated, it's considered white matter. And the myelination, because it's a fatty protein layer, actually has a white glistening appearance to it upon dissection. So when you open up a brain, you can see this in the sheep brain as well, you can actually identify where the gray matter is and where the white matter is. And the white matter is myelinated and the gray is unmyelinated. Okay? Now this doesn't hold true completely. But why would we myelinate some neurons, and why would we not myelinate others? Some you use more than others. Some may be more critical functioning. Some it might be important to send the signal more quickly, versus it's fine if the signal goes, and it doesn't necessarily have to be here overnight. Right? I can click on, uh, you know, ground ship, just whenever. Okay? So you have the option biologically to myelinate or not myelinate. It takes energy to do that. If it's a critical function, if it's a long distance, okay, if it's a commonly used area, it may be under myelinated activity or oversight. Okay, there's a question. Oh, I was going to ask if uh, the other nerve, is that... Uh, a pinched nerve uh, may not have anything to do with the nodes, nodes of Ron at all. So usually with a pinched nerve is something physically is putting pressure on the nerve and it's actually activating it. And it's triggering a signal to be sent. Okay? And, and that signal could also be sent to nociceptors, which are sensory receptors that receive stimulus or detect pain. So you could have a pinched nerve and no pain, so there's no nociceptor stimuli, or you can have a pinched nerve with sensation, with tingling, and pain, and it's probably all of the above. But the, the, the myelinated sheath might be completely intact. It's just putting pressure on that, on that nerve. Can you explain the nodes again? Do all of these myelinated sheaths have that sliver of exposed? Yes. Well, all myelinated sheaths are basically one Schwann cell or oligodendrocyte wrapping around this location, and the next one doing it is over here. So between here and here, there's a gap. So every myelinated neuron is this long, 
it might have four or five or seven hundred oligodendrocytes or Schwann cells, but they're they're spaced out like you guys are. But let's pretend that there's a, a bare seat in between each one of you. Okay, so if you look at a row of students, there'd be an empty seat. You'd sit every other. We don't have the luxury of doing that in this classroom. Um, it's biologically or metabolically less expensive to send it through a myelinated neuron. And you'll see why in the, in the, in the future lectures. Okay? Another thing that, that neurons benefit from with myelin, in the periphery and only in the periphery. Make sure you write this down. So this is not a function of the central nervous system. <clears throat> central nervous system has myelinated neurons. They help speed up action potential. They help to save biologic energy. They do not help neurons regenerate. That only happens in the periphery. So if you sever a peripheral nerve, you can regenerate it to a certain extent. And what ends up happening is the nerve that's cut off, the myelin forms a guidance tube, if you will, or what we call a regeneration tube. And the sprouting neuron, as it regrows, kind of grows in between these sheets of myelin, kind of like bumpers guiding it in which direction it's supposed to go. But this is only something that happens in the periphery. For example, if you have a patient that has a stroke, okay, and it's in the brain, which is part of the central nervous system, very likely there will be permanent damage that won't ever come back. Now, however, if that patient has a stroke to the right side, it's on the motor cortex, that controls the left hemisphere. Let's say the peripheral nerve that comes out to the face, the facial nerve, uh, is damaged and there's a lot of facial drooping. Well, it could actually recover to a certain extent or maybe completely. You might have known somebody that had a stroke and if the face was real droopy or uh, the left side was, was awkward motor-wise and some of it comes back, right? Sometimes it can come back. So peripheral nerves can actually regenerate to a certain extent. Here's another thing. How many of you have had surgery? Okay. So if you've had surgery, wherever your incision was, right, a few months after surgery was probably numb. There's probably a spot where the incision was made that was numb. Slowly over time, that spot probably shrank. There may be still areas that are still numb. But the region that was numb before, and the region now, maybe a year or two later, is probably far, far smaller. Is that true? Okay, so that's a demonstration that you can actually regenerate peripheral nerves to a certain extent. So let me get through this and we'll, we'll cover some questions. So if we look at this slide, we can kind of see number one, number two, number three is blocked by this uh, railing. Um, but what you can see is, here's our normal nerve, here's our nerve, here is our um, uh, axon, and it's myelinated, it's going to skeletal muscle. Okay, the myelin sheath is covering it. Here we've got some local trauma, we're in the periphery, so we have macrophages. If we we're in the central nervous system, you would actually see what cells there? Uh, uh, I dropped that one quickly on you. Yeah? Microglia, nicely done. So we're in the periphery, you know that because I'm labeling it as macrophages, not microglia. Uh, you have local trauma, that terminates the signal going here. A little bit over time, you can see that the nerve past the trauma is dead. And the muscle fiber that it innervated, because it's not being electrically stimulated, starts to shrink or atrophy. So you can see the diameter of these two tubes is actually smaller than those two tubes. That's actually a really well done drawing. I didn't do it. The publisher did. But that's, that's actually well characterized. Here you can start seeing that there's some sprouting that's taking place. And if we go to the next picture, you can identify that the early regeneration is coming down this regeneration tube that the myelin helps to guide. Once it makes a connection, you reestablish the regenerated fiber, and now these muscles actually are re innervated and they're usable, and they hypertrophy. They get bigger in size. Only in the periphery. We do not see this ability in the central nervous system. 
Central nervous system neurons do not regenerate. Okay? There's a question here and then over here. So Bell's palsy is an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon. It's actually rather common in college-age students. You might have known someone that had it. <clears throat> Usually this is an irritation or inflammation of the facial nerve. And <clears throat> it will subside, typically. Um, treatment <clears throat> usually include like corticosteroid treatments to try to decrease and uh, lessen the inflammatory response around the nerve. And when that kind of subsides, then the irritation to the nerve goes away. What Bell's palsy is, is an inflammation of usually facial nerve, the facial nerve, and depending upon what side it is, you'll get one side of the face that's kind of droopy, or the eye is kind of like droopy or really wide open, because you lose the muscle tone. And so those patients are usually really young, and, it has, and their very symptoms are like a stroke patient who's very old, um, and then they go in for testing and realize that there's an inflammation going on about the facial nerve. They treat the inflammation, a lot of times the Bell's palsy will be gone or, or be uh, fixed, remedied. Okay? This question over here. The uh, regeneration process, is that a possibility or a guarantee? That it's a possibility. Uh, good question. The regeneration process, is that a guarantee or is that more of a possibility? It's definitely more of a possibility. The smaller the nerve and the smaller the amount of trauma or damage, the more likely it will regenerate. The bigger the nerve, the longer the distance, it may regenerate some, but not all. It's not a guarantee. It's a guarantee that it will not happen in the central nervous system. Okay? Okay. Back here, and then up at the top, and then we'll have to move on. Uh, so people that have, like, uh, injuries to their uh, spinal cord that take like, quadriplegic, since the CNS can't regenerate, does some people can, like, develop some form of uh, nerve uh, uh, regeneration? How does that work? Because like, I know that they get the PNS nerves in your arm are, can regenerate, but isn't that connection lost between the PNS and the CNS, so it can So the, it's a good question. The question is, what about uh, spinal cord injury patients? Okay. So obviously it's, it's not simple. So it's going to sound like a simple explanation, but it's very complex. Um, the central nervous system, generally speaking, if you fracture and sever the spinal cord, where you sever it, it will not go back. It will not grow back. It will not regenerate. That's what all neurosurgeons will tell you. The problem is in trauma, it's sometimes difficult to determine the extent of the injury. And so once all of the inflammation dies down, a month or two later is when you may realize what's the extent of the damage. Okay. So a lot of times it looks like there's paralysis and then there's recovery in a spinal cord injury patient. The central dogma or the common thought process of what happened is the trauma that took place to sever the spinal cord wasn't complete. It wasn't all the way through. But the resulting traumatic injury was so big the inflammation shut down the distal nerves and when you recover that connection that's still maintained is allowed to be used. Now in the periphery we know we have great documentation that regenerates there, so there, there's not controversial discussions there, but usually the explanation about those cases is it probably wasn't a complete severing, otherwise we wouldn't have seen the recovery, if you will. But it emphasizes why PT is so important in these patients, because you don't want to just say, well, spinal cord injury, guess you're never going to walk. You, you, you want to hope for the best, and that's why you Many of you are going into this field, and you're going to be dealing with spinal cord injuries. You're going to be dealing with nerve damage. You're going to be deal dealing with pinched nerves or ruptured discs. We'll, we'll get to some of those later. Okay, last question, then i got to get going. Oh, someone just hopped in on your question. Sorry. Where, where are you? No, the gentleman was talking, then we'll take the, the young lady in the back. What about in the case of dislocation? Dislocation of what? If you dislocate a joint but you don't damage the nerve, is that what you're asking? You or you do damage the nerve. So depending upon how extensive the damage is to the nerve, it'll probably be able to be repaired at some level in the periphery. As long as that, I mean, most all the joints are in the periphery. Okay. And yes, 
Miss, and then we'll move on. Right. Incision, and you were talking about um, like three to six months, a couple of years. Um, if a person <coughs> had a major surgery, say nine years ago, and still has numb spots, would you say that it's after such a long period of time, those numb spots will never get Most likely, yes. Back? Yeah. Nine years is a long time to allow for nerves to regenerate in the periphery. If the, if the numbness hasn't completely gone away, that's probably where it'll be staying. Yep. Okay? Maybe it wasn't the answer you were hoping for, but that's probably the reality. Okay? Okay. If we look about neurons, they're long living. Our neurons are supposed to be lasting us a lifetime. That's the plan. Okay? So because of that, they don't divide. They're amitotic. So you've heard this statement probably, probably happened sometime in high school at a party, <coughs> that uh, when you kill brain cells, they don't come back. It's true. Okay? You're like, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, the guy that told me that was such a moron, I just never believed him. Well, he was right. Okay? Maybe only about that topic, but he was right at least once in his life. So they're amitotic, they don't divide. You're born <clears throat> with more central nervous system cells than what you're going to probably need or use. And there's a rate of death that takes place as we get older. It also is beneficial <clears throat> for us. We have complicated, you know, I'm not a neurophysiology expert, nor am I a neurosurgeon, but there are cases of patients that have strokes. And while the nerves and the central nervous system do not regenerate, if there are pathways that are in close proximity, you can actually, because of the plasticity of the nervous system, that word means that it can adapt. Proof of that is, how many of you play a musical instrument or are fairly skilled at a sport? Raise your hand. Okay? How many of you can write? That should be everybody, and you all should not be texting because the internet's down, so you should all be raising your hand. When you first learn how to write or play the piano or shoot a basketball, how was it to where you are now? Terrible. It's a terrible, okay? <laughs> Evidence of that is write with the other hand and see how they compare, okay? You can train the other hand to write just as well as your dominant hand because the nervous system is plastic. And that's why PT in post-stroke patients is so beneficial. You can't regenerate the central nervous system, but you can actually utilize pathways that aren't being used through other electrical signals to conduct some of the same types of activities. And you can reprogram or retrain the nervous system. Okay? So they're amitotic. They don't divide except for a very special case. Memory neurons actually divide. Memory neurons that are found in the hippocampus, as well as olfactory neurons. They also divide. You're like, what? Well, there's an interesting link between memory and olfaction. That's the sense of smell. <coughs> Case in point. Think about a favorite childhood memory right now. Okay? Think if you can associate a smell with that memory. Like, I'm making stuff up, but... Maybe you have a fond memory of like your grandmother, okay, or your grandfather. And it's like, you know, you could be walking through the mall and you smell her perfume, as disgusting as it might have been, but it reminds you of grandma, and you're like, oh, that reminds me of my grandma. You know, or maybe she was a great cook or, or liked to bake. Because every time you smell like a, uh, a, 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 a turkey in the oven, you think of Thanksgiving at grandma's house. So our sense of smell is very closely tied to memory. Okay? So those are the only two neurons that actually do divide. They have a very high metabolic rate, neurons in general. And you can see their general architecture here that we've shown a few times. This is our uh, cell body, our soma, the nucleus, demonstrating that it's just a cell. But it has this elongated, stretched out portion of it, which is the axon. And this 
terminates down here, and this is going to innervate onto either an effector organ or another neuron. And on top here, these little branches, which is really what dendrites mean, is where it receives signals, electrical signals, from another neighboring neuron, for example. Okay? So they have bundles of these arm-like projections or processes. If we're talking about a group of neurons in the central nervous system, we usually use the nomenclature of trap. So nerve tracks are tracks that, that move from like the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. Or nerve tracks are tracks that come from the motor cortex and come down, actually they come uh, down the ventral root horn of the spinal cord, and they're going to project out. When they leave the central nervous system, then we usually call them nerves in the periphery, or nerve bundles. So it's just a nomenclature um, identification that gives us uh, an idea of where we are. So if we look at some of the other things that I've already kind of talked about, in the very beginning of the lecture, I made the statement, these are just cells. Uh, neurophysiologists would be upset with that statement, but I'm just trying to prove a point that they're not as scary as they might look. You know about cells. You know that they have um, endoplasmic reticulum. That's what a nissel body is. We just label it something specific in a nerve. We have nuclei, just like what you see in a regular cell. The nuclei are organized in clusters of cell bodies in the central nervous system. And in the peripheral nervous system, this, the nuclei are organized in these clusters of cell bodies that we call ganglia. So we'll see the word ganglia used. That's just a grouping of cell bodies of nerves in the periphery. No big deal. We have these dendrite projections that we talked about that are tree-like branches that receive signals from other nerves. And then we have this long extension called the axon, which is what we myelinate if we're going to myelinate. And you can kind of appreciate that this axon, axon is bifurcated. That means it branches. There's a collateral that goes over here to the right, and another collateral that comes down and goes down here. And then you can see another branch and another branch. So the idea of having collateral axons branching over is for biologic redundancy. So anytime in, the, in, in biology you see redundancy or backups, that should tell you it must be pretty important for the survival of the organism. So if we have something wrong with this axon collateral, this signal still goes down this way. Or if this one gets severed, we still have the ability to send signals through some collateral types of projections. That's the plasticity capabilities I was talking about. So if there is damage, you could use collateral and plasticity to kind of reroute the signal. If we look at the axon, we call this region right here where it begins the axon hillock. The axon hillock is kind of like this funnel-shaped component that comes right off of the soma and then into the main part of the axon. At the axon hillock, is where we're going to see a lot of summation of the electrical signal. We're going to start talking about electrical signals and reaching a point of what we call threshold in order to set an action potential. And that determination is made at the axon hillock. The axon collaterals are these branches that come out. The terminal branches are when you get down to the end of the axon, just before you get to the synaptic knob. The synaptic knob is, it looks kind of like a button. So it's an axon that comes down, and it kind of bulges out. And at the end there, you're going to take vesicles, and those vesicles are going to have a neurotransmitter in them, a chemical signal. They're going to fuse with the membrane surface and dump their content into a gap. It'll cross this little gap, it'll bind on the other side, and it'll trigger the action potential, the electrical signal to happen downstream. The axoplasm itself. The axoplasm is what? What do you think the axoplasm is? Think about a normal cell. What's that? Cytoplasm. Who said it? That's all it is. Axoplasm is cytoplasm. That's the fluid inside the cell 
And this happens to be a specialized cell called a nerve. So down the axon, we have what we call axoplasm. We also have what we call axoplasmic flow, which isn't on the slide. But axoplasm flow is how you get these electrical, I'm sorry, these chemical signals down to the synaptic knob. You manufacture them here from a signal from the nucleus, creates a protein, transcribes the RNA, translates the protein, puts it in a vesicle, and that vesicle gets propagated via axoplasmic flow to the synaptic knob where it's going to stay. Okay? The axolemma, what's the axolemma? What's the axolemma on a nerve? No idea? No. It's just the cell membrane, guys. It's just the cell membrane. You're doing the reading, right? Mm -hmm. Internet's down. Can't read. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Hopefully it's back up by Monday. Okay, so here's a electron micrograph showing the details. This is you see this round structure in the background? Yeah. That's the second neuron. And in the foreground towards you are the very ends, the synaptic knobs of neuron number one. So neuron number one synaptic knobs innervating onto neuron number two. And you can kind of see how close in proximity. You see there's a little bit of a gap right here. These guys look like they're touching, but they're not. If you look like right here at the right angle, you can see that there's a little bit of a gap. Look at all of those synaptic knobs. Every single one of them has, a, has vesicles in their presynaptic side. The postsynaptic side is the other neuron. And the gap in between is called the synapse, or the cleft, the synaptic cleft. <coughs> so if we categorize these neurons, we can categorize them a number of ways. We can do this structurally or functionally. We've already kind of talked about it functionally. But we'll come back to that just one more time. But structurally, this is how we would, we would look at them. They don't all necessarily look like these drawings that we've drawn. In fact, most commonly, they look like this. Multipolar neurons. Multipolar neurons are the most common. 99% of the neurons in the body are multipolar structurally. They have three or more processes, as you can see here. I mean, look at this one. Multipolar neurons have many dendrites. Some of them even have no axon. So you can see right here, lots of dendrites. And, well, I guess there's an axon right here, but some of them won't even have an axon in some cases. Most of the neurons in the brain are multipolar structurally. Bipolar. Bipolar is the one that we like to draw because it's nice and clean. Okay? It's our model neuron. If only all neurons could look like the model. Okay? This is the cover shot. Okay? This is like GQ cover or Glamour magazine cover. Not everybody looks like that. So this is what they think in textbooks a neuron should look like. So that's the way they draw it. Bipolar. Nice and symmetrical, right? You have, a, you have the cell body in the middle. You have dendrites on one side. You have a nice long axon on the other. They're on either sides of the soma or the cell body. But they're actually a far more rare than multipolar. You're going to find these in the olfactory mucosa as well as at the back of the eye in the retina. And the last ones are called unipolar. These ones are kind of funky. I mean, look at that. So the unipolar, they have one process. It divides into a proximal and a distal branch. And both are actually technically considered axons. You can kind of see the label is showing that there are axons on either side. We're going to see these primarily in the, um, in the, in the general senses or the primary senses, like temperature regulation or uh, responses to light, like photoreception. <coughs> Um, if we look at another way to classify, 
We can classify them functionally, which is kind of where we started the lecture. So structurally is the way they look. Functionally is about what they do. So if we look functionally, we either can see that they're sensory, otherwise known as afferent. They're carrying information to the central nervous system. Or efferent would be motor function. Their role is to send information out from the central nervous system into the periphery, to a muscle or to a gland, to go do some type of activity. Or thirdly, they can be classified as interneurons, as we said earlier, otherwise known as association neurons, meaning they're going to connect the dots. This happens a lot inside the brain or, or the central nervous system, where you get sensory input in, and then it sends signal like, oh, I smell turkey baking in the oven. Right? And that goes to the hippocampus, as well as to the olfactory region. And you have a memory that's triggered by the smell. And that's two different locations in the brain because you have association neurons that are connecting the dots. Okay? You see a certain symbol visually that recalls a memory of, I know the brand of soda that that is. I know the brand of clothing that is because they want you to use interneurons to associate their logo with their product. Right? All right, questions? Yeah, why is it that we, we don't also have connection between the memory neurons and also your tongue and sense of taste? Shouldn't we have that also? Because Well, um, there's a simple answer. I don't know if this is really the answer. This is my guess. The sense of smell is far more sensitive than taste. Yeah. So you have about 10,000... Uh, taste receptors in the mouth and the hard palate in the oral cavity, and you have almost 10 times that in the olfactory mucosa. So your ability to discriminate flavors is actually more from your smell than it is from your taste. Uh, okay, I have, I have one more question. Okay, hold that, hold that thought till later. Okay, I got to, I got to keep going. Resting and graded potential. So I want to leave before. Um, I want to lead you before next week into thinking about moving ions. And we talked about this in the general part of Unit 1, and some of you are still struggling with it. So now's the time to get this stuff worked out, because we're going to really spend a lot of energy in this unit on moving of ions. Okay? Some of you are struggling with what NA stands for and what K stands for. Some of you are struggling with what their charge is. Some of you are struggling with which way they go. So I'm telling you, you need to get this stuff worked out in SI this week. Otherwise, you're going to get lost really fast. Okay? So this should be complete review. If this is not complete review, then you are behind. And now is the time to get caught up. If you cannot replicate this slide, then you need, you need to do some work. Replicate means exact, right? Like how much of it do you want me to know? Replicate. So for example, this is the phospholipid bilayer. That should be total review. This is a transmembrane protein. That's total review. This transmembrane protein happens to have an affinity for sodium. You should write that down if you didn't know that that was sodium. And this one that's conveniently colored blue has an affinity for potassium. I write that down as well if you can't remember that K is potassium. This guy is allowing for sodium to come from outside the cell into the cell. This one's allowing for potassium to come from inside the cell to outside the cell. These are large anions. What are some examples of large anions inside a cell? What are anions, Dr. Keller? That should also be reviewed. Negatively, negatively charged molecules. So what are some examples of negatively charged molecules that reside inside a cell? That's large? Large. Or is it small? It is negatively charged, I agree. Half point. Proteins. RNA. These are all very large molecules that are negatively charged. Okay? So a cell is a neuron is a cell, and it is excitable. It has the ability to fire. 
What does that word mean to you? Fire. An action potential. Okay, so you're throwing out words, but what does it mean? Make an electrical signal. Make an electrical signal. Do you see any electricity on this slide? Yes, where is it? There's a slight negative charge inside the cell. Is there anything else that's charged on this slide? Yeah, of course. Yeah, you can't see it? So which one is it? I'm going to call you on that. What is specifically charged on this slide? The fluids? Not necessarily the fluids. What is charged? Whoever said, yeah, speak up. I'm ready for you. What is charged on this slide? Sodium is charged. What's its charge? Plus one. Holy crap, sounds like chemistry, color. It is. That's why you took it. What else is charged? Potassium. Nicely done. So if we move sodium and potassium in different directions... Are we moving electricity? Yes. Let me repeat that. If we move sodium or potassium, are we moving electricity? Yes, because why? Because they're charged. So the way the cell likes to set this up, this is the extracellular fluid, this is the intracellular fluid down here, is we have a pump. You're like, oh man, I just, I just had it down and now you threw in the pump thing. You have a sodium-potassium pump, and it pumps how many sodiums in which direction? Three sodiums where? Out. It's not even shown on the slide. You could draw it in right over here. The sodium-potassium pump pumps three sodiums out, and it pumps two potassiums in. Remember that? That makes sodium build up to about 145 milliequivalent per liter outside the cell. It makes potassium build up to about the same, about 145 to 150 milliequivalent per liter. I would just memorize the number of 145 because it's pretty much the same between both of them. So it's high sodium outside, high potassium inside. If I open a sodium channel, what happens? Via diffusion, sodium wants to come in. If I open a, pota uh, excuse me, a potassium channel, that's correct, which direction does it want to go via diffusion? Out. Okay, very good. So now, if we look at regulating what goes in and out, this is where we can start moving ions. So here you can see, here is a nerve. This is big giant red arrows. Pay attention to me, that's what that means. That's the direction current's going. Here this box diagram is this dendrite receiving electrical signal, and that's what's blown up down here. You with me? So here we have high sodium out. Remember, sodium is always colored orange on our slides. Sodium is high outside the cell. If you have a ligand binding and opens the channel, sodium is going to rush in. If the resting membrane potential of the cell is typically negative and sodium comes flooding in, what does that do to that electrical signal at that specific location inside the cell. It makes it positive. You've just moved electricity. All depolarization or an electrical signal is, is a difference in current. Right? That's why there's a positive and negative terminal on a battery. Have you ever taken a 9 volt and put it on your tongue? No. Okay. Well, you can and you'll give it a little bit of a shock. Uh, but it proves that electricity flows from one end to the other. Okay? So this is how you create an electrical signal inside the cell. Now, it could be a ligand. If it's a ligand or if it's electricity, like, you know, how many of you have ever been to a gated community or live in a gated community where you have a garage door opener? Right? You push a button and then the door goes, right? It's pretty cool. Or you punch in and it goes, right? And the door goes, I don't remember if it pounds before or after, every community is different, it seems. But the gate's open, right? So that's electrical regulated gate. So it could be either ligand or voltage. Those are going to be active because they take some activity to take place, so they require energy or ATP. If you have just a channel that's open all the time, it's called a leak channel. An example of the leak channel is the potassium leak channel. 
There in neurons is a potassium leak channel that always stays open. And it always allows potassium to flow out. It's a little inefficient, but it serves a purpose that we'll talk about here next time we're together. So we have an example of a leak channel, which is the potassium leak channel, always open. And we have gated channel. That means it has a gate that can open and close. Okay? The last slide that I want to leave you with is this, before you pack up. You guys did a great job with no texting. I know you're like, right? Shaking, you're sitting on your hands. The resting membrane potential inside the cell is slightly negative. It's minus 70 millivolts inside a neuron. That's the same electricity that's found in the wall. This is in voltage. These are in millivolts, or one, one thousandth of a volt. So it's little electricity, if you will. But it is voltage. It's electricity. It's just on a small scale because it's a very micro-architectural scale. If you insert an electrode inside the neuron and you measure it compared to outside the neuron, you see a difference. That's the potential. Potential is a difference in electrical signal. That resting membrane potential is really only at the very interface of the plasma membrane. If you move closer to the nucleus, it's essentially electrically zero. What sets the resting membrane potential? It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily set it. It helps to maintain it. The sodium potassium ATPase helps to maintain the resting membrane potential. Because you're leaving, le losing three sodiums, and you're only bringing in two potassiums. You take out three positives, you only bring two positives in. That's a net difference of one. You with me? But what establishes the resting membrane potential from the beginning is all those large negative anions. In addition to those large negative anions, like proteins and mRNA, you have the sodium potassium pump that's always running. Okay? This is where we'll pick up Monday. Have a nice weekend.